Welcome to Between Two Pastries, a not-so-typical nutrition podcast. Nicole and Annie are licensed and registered dietitians. Join them as they discuss hot nutrition topics, challenge popular beliefs, and have a blast doing it. Here are your hosts, Nicole and Annie. Welcome to Between Two Pastries, everybody. This is Nicole. Annie is on maternity leave at the moment, so I am uh, just taking care of a very exciting interview that we had planned. Uh, We have back uh, Dr. Monlock. Welcome, Dr. Monlock. And we have a client of mine and a past client of Dr. Monlock, who's also on the call today. We thought that this was a really important subject to discuss, and my dear, dear client um, is such a perfect person to have on as part of our our guests here as we talk about these two subjects. And so today we're talking about client-patient advocacy, which is so important. And I'm finding in my, in my practice, I'm finding I am, this is happening all the time. Um, And we also really, really want to stress the importance of hormonal health in general. And like I said, um, my client, uh, Brittany, uh, you just have a phenomenal story. And um, anyway, I'm excited to get rolling into this. So uh, without further ado, welcome both of you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Why don't we actually kind of start from the beginning? I had been working with uh, Brittany for quite some time and uh, working with her initially on some, you know, sports nutrition, um, you know, just, you know, performance and, and weight management type things around that. We were do- having really, really nice result, And then there came a time where I was watching things and they were starting to change when nothing else that we were doing was changing because of, um, the work um, and involvement that I have so gratefully had with you, Dr. Monlock, I have learned so much just from working alongside of you with myself, as well as people I have referred, that I knew hands down, we had a ton of red flags here. And I just said, hey, listen, you know, this is what I'm thinking. I think we really got to look into this stuff. And I'm so glad that we did because we didn't wait that long, which was really good. And so that kind of led you to working with Dr. Monlock. But in the meantime, you were really getting some some kickback from like your physicians as well, like around the whole thing. So at any rate, let's start there. Sure. Um, Just to give some kind of background for myself and kind of getting to the point, even with Nicole, So back in 2011, um, I tore my ACL meniscus playing basketball. Um, I had been a runner in high school, in college on a club team. And then in, I was in grad school at the time, still kind of active in the club. So tore it in 2011 and looking back on it, I think some of the symptoms and things, the the signs were there before that, Um, but that was kind of really the impetus for things really going where, you know, I knew that obviously I'm going to rehab. I'm not going to be able to run like that for a while and do things. And so I had noticed, like, for example, a pretty big weight gain or pretty drastic weight gain that then started and kind of kept compounding for the years after. And I always just assumed, well, it had to have been something I did. Um, You know, even though I know how to fuel as an athlete, um, never had problems before with anything, something happened around the knee and the rehab and just going forward. And like I said, again, it was probably, it was happening before that. I know it was kind of at the end of college, you know, with not sleeping great, um, work, school, running, everything, compounding, perfect storm. And then, um, you know, I think the shredding my knee just happened to be kind of the perfect storm of everything coming in. But, you know, so then for the next four, five, six years after that, um, I would, you know, I worked, I would go to the doctor and I would hear things like, well, your weight's, you know, creeping up there, which I was aware of. And I said, you know, something is wrong. Something's off. Um, I have another friend with kind of similar issues who put it really perfectly and said, you know, if if I was a machine, I can tell I'm not running optimally. Like something is just, it's off. I can't describe what it is, but I know it. And, you know, getting pushback from doctors or confusion or, you know, having no idea. And I'm like, well, medically, I don't know, but I can just, I tell you some of the symptoms, things like, you know, obviously the weight gain, I'm sluggish. Things take a lot more effort working out. Um, it's harder to run. Um, you know, I would come home, I worked long hours, 
I would come home, I'd be exhausted. I'd sleep, get up, eat a little something, go back to bed, which I knew was not good. Um, like on Sundays, a lot of times if I didn't have anything, I would just pretty much, you know, get up, run, eat, do a few things, then go back and kind of lay around in bed all day and like recover and get ready for the week. And I just thought, well, you know, nowadays too, I'm like, oh, it's the, just the crushing weight of the crushing defeat of life as a mid thirties, <laughs> like that's not be normal. Um, and you know, just again, kind of low self-esteem frustration of going, I'll never be back to where I ever, ever used to be like, wow, holy cow. Um, having had one doctor, my, one of my, my former primary care provider tell me, um, you know, the one that said, well, your weight's creeping up being told, well, just, you know, drink green smoothies. And I'm like, that's not, I don't think that's going to cut it. And also, you know, having said like, I run, I, f- I need to feel, I need to do stuff, um, kind of, you know, running into that wall. And so, yeah, I had gotten referred to Nicole in like 2017, 2018 to start working and did see results. And then we kind of got to the point, like she mentioned where things plateaued and, mm-hmm you know, again, she's like, you know, you should consider going and getting like the blood, the full blood draw, which I had never had. Um, it had never been a thing. I didn't even, I, mean, I knew you could do it, but it had never been suggested by another provider that I'd seen, um, you know, over the years, nothing. And so I initially resisted more cause I was scared. Um, I never used to have to really go to the doctor for anything. And I was like, I don't, what if they find something really bad? And I know obviously that's the wrong take. Um, you want to find out what, what, what's happened and what, you, what you can do to address it. And so, um, went to Dr. Monlock and had the full panel drawn and found out that I had elevated levels of testosterone, uh, lower progesterone and estrogen. So I had the symptoms and some of the other symptoms around it that are in line with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so then kind of from there, you know, and also some low vitamins and things being off, my iron was really low and, uh, you know, from there went on a plan with getting hormones, um, a testosterone blocker, and then elevating my estrogen, progesterone, addressing some of those vitamin deficiencies. So vitamin D, my iron, vitamin B, and, uh, kind of over the course of, you know, a few months, that was July of 2022. And so we are now in December of, uh, 2023. And so I knew it would take a few months to, to, you know, I'm undoing a decade or more of things that have been going on in my body and trying to reset, reevaluate, uh, you know, get it, get a whole new body basically. And so I kept training for things. And I really noticed, um, the first time was actually last November. I did an 8k out in Philadelphia and again, had really no expectation going in, um, kind of leading up to that. I would have to stop a lot, even in races, walk fatigue, um, you know, just a complete 180 from what I used to be able to do. And so just went in with a pace and went, well, we'll just, we'll see how it goes. And from there, uh, you know, didn't stop at all, obviously felt more fatigued as the race went on, but it felt more like it used to, and followed that up with some races in the spring and in the summer and in the fall here, and I'm gearing up for in the next, next spring coming with some longer distance stuff. And even just in my training, it, it feels like a complete difference and it's, it keeps getting better. I mean, the paces keep dropping, but also just my body seems to be responding. I think that would be the biggest thing I notice is just, I'm not fighting myself on stuff, not only in day-to-day work or in day-to-day things and activities, but also, you know, if I'm going to train for something or do any kind of physical activity, my body for the most part will respond to it. And I'm not fighting just a crushing wall. Like I'm trying to run through it. I also have more energy to do things. So, you know, a lot more energy to cook, pursue interests, um, be active, just not just in running, but in other things, um, sleeping better overall. I just, you know, we'll get a good night's sleep. Now I used to really struggle with that. And I always thought that was pretty much because my mind doesn't shut off, which is still a thing, but again, those hormones playing into it, uh, I don't feel as exhausted. So I don't really, you know, I definitely don't need to sleep like one day a week to recover or do anything, you know, maybe a nap here and there, but again, it's more, a more a little power nap if need be. Um, feeling better, you know, some of my food cravings around different things have changed. And then also what really picked up, um, this past May into this, into the summer and into the fall and kind of still going that all of a sudden the weight has started to come off. Um, and just, you know, things are happening. The muscle came off a little bit, but it's still on. But again, I'm finding it easier to move and do things when I'm at the gym, you know, lifting and things like that. Um, my knee, I think feels less stressed. It's not as much pain, even when the weather shifts, I think that'll always be a thing for the rest of my life. Um, a repaired knee. So those drop drops and changes in pressure. Some days I can just tell it's a little sore than others. But again, I think in the last year here, that's really gone down or maybe again, there's a day here and there, but it's not, it's not the constant things. Like there's less stress and less stress on the joints, which is kind of my overall, my overall goal for it. So it's, it's definitely, um, 
been a great change and, you know, it's still, we're still on the journey. There's still a long way to go here for it, but it's, it's nice to finally have some answers and it's nice to finally start to feel like it used, I used to, or start to feel more like myself as cliche that as that might sound. Well, mm-hmm. what I find super phenomenal is, um, you know, part of this whole patient advocacy thing is that, you know, it took a physician who was open-minded enough to do an, a, such a comprehensive, and again, you know, Dr. Mon, like you're recently retired, but I really admire your work because you're one of the only physicians I've ever known to, and I, whenever I would refer people to you to, I said, okay, literally it's going to be tubes and tubes and tubes. <laughs> like you are going to get like a whole thing. Like, but the cool part about it is that she literally is going to tell you exactly what is going on and how your body is communicating or not communicating. And I think that the thing about, you know, you, Brittany, is you had the symptoms of clear, 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 clear PCOS for a very long time. It's not a very, um, odd diagnoses. And I, I'm just shocked at how no one you were working with thought for a moment, maybe because it doesn't require a whole lot to look into it. And I think that's the thing that bothers me the most is that you suffered for so long. And it's funny in talking to people as I've, I've told a few people about it and it's, it's really hard for me to be vulnerable. So I've told a few people about it. Actually, it's really you know, interesting how many of my other friends are either have it or know someone who has it and are familiar with it. So it's yeah. definitely, you know, a pretty, unfortunately, a pretty common thing. There are different symptoms for different people. It's a whole range of stuff, but again, there's some pretty clear cut things. Um, and even, you know, finding, keep have, finding doctors who will do it. Um, you know, I went in to get referred for a new primary this last year while, you know, in the middle of it, so about a year after I've been taking hormones, was actually able to get the prescription, but I said, you know, and I'm due for another, you know, blood draw and stuff. And they did it. They didn't order the hormone one. They did the rest of the blood panel. And so I was like, I'm I'm here for that. Like, what do you, what do you want? You didn't want to do that. Um, saw a different clinic who was, you know, didn't want to do it or get into it because they just assumed, cause I have a family history of cancer. Well, I'm going to get cancer. Or they're going to contribute to it. And I said, well, but if I have the hormone, my, my hormones are off and I have the hormones of a menopausal woman 20 years before I hit menopause, doesn't that mean I'm at a higher risk right now? Yes. Things are unbalanced. Um, and I actually went and saw an endocrinologist too, as, as a backup and a plan. And, you know, they they specialize in hormones and, you know, again, it was Pardon. kind of just brushed off. Um, <laughs> supposedly they're specialized. Yeah. They, they, they was kind of brushed off. And so, yeah. Um, you know, I was told, well, that's not the reason I'm losing weight or doing anything. The hormones wouldn't do that. I said, well, you know, I kind of joked sort of not really. And I said, well, it's, it's either that, you know, it's the only thing I've changed. So it's either that, or I have a, you know, cancer or something like, what do you, I don't know. What is it? I'm just sitting there going, you have the labs. I brought in the labs that, you know, I had done previously with Dr. Monlock every three months. Like you can see the changes. Um, you can see my most recent ones in July, you know, and this was, this was in October. I said, the results are, are there. And, you know, I'm telling you again, just like I shared in this podcast, the kind of the story, how I felt before, how I feel now disregarded, um, and was told I'm not addressing PCOS. So potential insulin resistance. So I am also on metformin now for that, which I'm fine with. I said, great. Like we can address that if there is some of that, but also I still want to keep doing the hormones because that is a, still a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. And I would like to not have unbalanced hormones just for my overall long-term health. Like that, it can't hurt me to balance that. It's nice to have a hormonal panel of the age that you are. <laughs> Correct. And so, you know, and they actually wanted me to get off the hormones and just test my labs again here at the end of November, just to see where I'm at. Cause they said, well, we wouldn't have even started you on that. Cause you were getting your period. You were doing this. And I said, well, I, I had other symptoms. Like I didn't have the irregular periods, but I had some other symptoms. Um, and she was comfortable with the symptoms I had the endocrinologist mm-hmm. saying that I had PCOS. And so I said, well, okay. Um, so that was, that was a bit interesting or, you know, that I was told she was glad I was working with a dietitian and just told me, you know, what she would tell her patients is to start a food journal and through that. And then, you know, again, seemed to be okay with keeping prescribing stuff, but then was like, well, you wouldn't need this and this and this. And so I did not do, I did not go off the hormones for two months to do the labs. Um, my, my primary seeds, you know, she seemed to kind of see to the endocrinologist or, you know, I talked to her about it too. It was more, you know, dosages and things like that, but she didn't seem completely opposed, not as much as that one clinic I went to this summer, but 
it's it's pretty mind boggling and you know, pretty eye opening to be able to hand them results, like physical results of your blood panels from a year or more. And then also kind of what was happening. I had my medical charts from the last decade over so they could see things before that with weight and everything. And it was still kind of mind boggling and eye opening how I can sit there, present it with the story to them and they can, be, you know, just again, kind of brush it aside um, for that. So it really speaks to how people and again, not just for this, but I know, you know, pick a thing, pick a condition, pick a disease, pick an illness, pick anything, and how people often have to advocate for themselves um, and fight and, you know, go through the frustration of waiting months and months and months, trying this and that and this and that all around to try and find somebody who would be willing to listen and trust that, trust your story and trust the results and try and work with you on it, um, or at least try and learn more about it if they need to, um, and try and work with you on it and how you have to really advocate for yourself, unfortunately. Um, is especially if you know, at least if you know what you need to advocate about, I think that was the thing too. I struggled with in the first few years is I didn't even know what I didn't know what I didn't know. And so it was extra, it was extremely hard and extra hard for me to, to advocate for myself because, you know, all I really had to go off of is I, I know something's off. I can't tell you what, but I know I don't, something's wrong. Um, it's, it's, I'm not operating at full capacity here. And just, you know, general confusion or, well, I can't do anything with that. Or I can't code that for anything for a lab. And I thought, well, okay, but surely I can't be the only one coming in. And I've, again, I've seen that with, um, you know, friends and family with different things. You know, my dad has gone into doctors and said, you know, I'm feeling sluggish and he's in his seventies. I'm feeling sluggish. I'm more tired. And his doctor just laughed and said, well, you're old. And I'm like, that's, that's okay. Part of it, but also there's probably hormones off or something else that's addressed that of course, you know, they're never going to do, though he gets blood drawn for other stuff. They're never going to do the full panel. Um, and do that. So I, I think it unfortunately happens a lot. And um, I'm really fortunate to have a, you know, have a care team here and, you know, have been a prior uh, patient of Dr. Monlock's um, before she retired, where I was able to kind of get those answers and, you know, find things out. So I'm very grateful and grateful to Nicole for pushing me out of my comfort zone to try and find things out. Well, and the thing about it, Brittany, that I just want to give you a whole lot of credit for, though, is that you have you have shown so much um, bravery and strength and tenacity and like you are not backing down like, you know, you went to these people and it's like, yeah, unacceptable moving on like you just kept going and pushing and like, no, no. And it takes, though, it takes being brave enough and it takes being like, you know, your physician is not over you. And to the point of what Brittany was saying is that I know something is off and it's kind of like someone else cannot tell you that you're wrong. Like that is number one, hands down, absolutely not okay. It's just not okay. And I know a lot of people are hearing that. And I am just really, really wanting people to go, if you know something is not wrong, then you keep saying something is not wrong and you demand that they find out. <laughs> like, no, we have to find out. Like we have to find out. There has to be another way, you know? Absolutely. I think... Um... I run into this, not myself personally, but I work, I work in healthcare and, you know, kind of the struggle, um, which I can get from the provider perspective, you know, when you're trying to find the answers, you don't have a lot to go off of, but you know, when people come in and they're like, I'm in pain and, you know, or something's off and it's like, you know, as much as the provider knows they can't assess your pain level. Only, you know, if something's off or something's in pain or, you know, you can tell like, they're never going to be able to run a test and fully understand how you feel. Um, mentally or physically, they can only look at things like labs. And so it's definitely an issue, again, not just for things like this, but all across healthcare of, you know, it it, it takes, unfortunately, trying to find providers um, in wherever the emergency setting, the primary setting, whatever, um, specialty setting, anything who are able to listen or, you know, won't give up and say, okay, well, all right, you say there's something wrong. I'm going to trust you because you're not in here for fun. Obviously you're seeing me because you have an issue. You probably have better things to do than take time out for appointments. And so, yeah, you're in here because like you, you don't know what else to do. Um, and we, let's figure something out. Like there's gotta be a reason for something right. or let's at least try different things. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that was exactly, Brittany, you were exactly the kind of patient that would walk into my office. You know, when I was working, the patient that wasn't getting answers elsewhere and you're right, you know, your body, you're the one who lives in your body. You're the one who knows something is off. And you don't wake up in the morning and go, wow, I really hope I have a crappy day today. Of course <laughs> not, you know? So, but but sometimes what we get stuck in is that the doctor always knows the answer. 
And the unfortunate thing is that hormone is something that isn't taught in medical school. What? I'm going to say that again. Hormone and hormone balancing is not taught in medical school. The only time that female hormones are even looked at is if you're infertile and you're at the infertility specialist, by the way, ka-ching, ka-ching, mm. and they're trying artificial insemination or all sorts of means that are extremely expensive per cycle, sometimes twelve to $15,000 per mm. cycle to try to get you pregnant. Well, that's the only time that, quote, hormone is considered something that's worthy of checking. Yet polycystic ovary is a genetic condition that is affecting 15 to 20% of women. So what is polycystic ovary is when you make more male hormone than female. Mm -hmm. What? And you, your, your mind just goes, what? And wait a minute, I'm a female. Well, you're right. Your metabolism is female. You're set up genetically as a female XX. But guess what? PCO and PCOS, the syndrome is that you actually make more male hormone and it throws your metabolism into a complete tailspin. Yet you can function. And mm -hmm. in some ways you compensate in certain symptoms and in certain body systems and in others, you compensate less well and in others you decompensate. Mm -hmm. So the symptoms are different in every patient. So how can a scientist, a physician, even address the possibility of, could you have polycystic ovary unless they look? Mm -hmm. Isn't science based on fact? Mm -hmm. Isn't science something that we look for the, in show me the facts, show me the information. Right. And then you use that information to draw your conclusion based upon the before, whether or not you, you utilize some sort of treatment or change in action, and then the after. Isn't that what medicine is supposed to be? Mm -hmm. But they don't look because they're not taught to look. And you would think endocrinology would know to look, but they hear female hormones and they just go, oh, yeah. wait a minute, wait a minute, go back to your GYN. I don't deal with that. Exactly. And there you are stuck right back on the do loop. Mm -hmm. And it's the way that that I always explained optimal health is you have to have, it's the four hormone legs of your chair. So if one leg of your hormone chair is your female male hormones and that leg is broken, you now are trying to sit on a three-legged chair with a broken leg. Well, what happens? You're going to land on the floor you don't even realize the leg is broken. So you dutifully rewrite the chair and sit down in the chair and boom, you're back on the floor. Well, I call that Groundhog Day. You just keep doing the same thing and you're expecting different results, but you're getting the same results. So something has to change. So right. you have to do the root cause analysis and figure out which of these four legs is off. Is it your female male hormones? In a polycystic ovary, it is. But it means the other three are working harder to try to help because right. that's what other legs of chairs do. They now have to compensate for the broken leg. So your other groups are your thyroid, your adrenal, which is your cortisol and what supports your adrenal, your vitamin B12, and your insulin is the fourth hormone. But nobody checks insulin they'll oh. tell you you're insulin resistant but they don't check your insulin so wait a minute how does that science add up to your insulin resistant but i don't know your insulin number there's a disconnect and the disconnect is we are not looking for the labs the science to help explain the symptoms so right. Brittany, you actually, and I'm, this is a blank sheet, but this is an example, is one of these quick and dirty worksheets that everybody, before they go to the doctor even, should fill out because the reality is you get to the doctor's office and in a hospital-based system where the hospital runs the physician practice, you, the doctor is given two and a half minutes 
two and a half minutes to spend with you in the room. And then he turns it over to the nurse. So if you have, and I'll just make up a number, five things on here, but you don't have this sheet with you, you've got them in your head. So you've got two and a half minutes to get all five of these out. He's gonna hear the first one, key on that, and then tell his nurse, all right, here's the diagnosis we're gonna work on. And it's only the first of five that you gave him. Mm. Instead, if you have all of them marked, you've given him notice, hey, there's more than one thing we're gonna work on. There's four other things on that sheet and I want them all addressed. And sure as shooting, what you'll hear back is you'll need to make another appointment because that's we're done with our time here today. Yeah. It's, no, I want you to understand these are grouped in hormone groups. And I want my hormone levels checked. You have the right to say that. And I'm giving you that power right now. Yeah. And what I want you to do is walk in with that sheet. You get that sheet from my book. And this is the adolescent book to age 25. This is the perimenopause, menopause and beyond book. The worksheet is in both books. And I go through at the back how to talk to your doctor. Mm -hmm. Because I realized that this is all my original research because nobody's doing it. They're mm -hmm. not teaching this in right. medical school. So you actually are going to be educating your doctor, right. whether they want to be educated or not, mm -hmm. you know, but I empower you with the knowledge to say, this is my symptom list. This is how I feel with your check marks. And I want these labs checked. It's in the back of this book. By the way, I'll leave a copy of it for you so right. that you can do further reading. And that's, <clears throat> That's really, now you are your own best advocate. So I just want to make real quick mention that uh, we will have those resources available in the notes of the podcast. So you will actually have access to the list of things that Dr. Monluck is actually talking about. In addition to, you'll also receive um, the links to check out her uh, books too, if um, you would like to uh, learn a little bit more about the things that we are talking about today too. So um, thank you for that. But I think that that's, you know, <laughs> you know, if people did walk in with that sheet though, it, it, it would be very interesting to sort of see how that, con how different that conversation could potentially go. And um, I like that idea. In fact, um, I may actually make copies of that in my own practice. And when I start seeing red flags again, like I have with my clients, you know, prior to your retirement, uh, this is actually a, a way in which I can give them, like you just said, a little bit of self-empowerment to go, hey, let's validate what you're feeling here. Bring this in to your person, you know, and see what they can do for you or how they are, they could be willing to work with you. Um, and at least then it would, it might be something more, you know, uh, right. for people. And there is a lab, it's an, ex, it's a, um, it's a patient portal extension of LabCorp, which is a lab that I used a lot in the office when I was working called Life Extensions. And Life Extensions is actually something that you as the patient can go on and you can order your own labs. And it is at a discount. And what's really nice about that is that you can order labs that perhaps your doctor who is less enlightened would forget to or would not order for you. So it's your workaround, if you will, uh, so that you don't continue to butt heads and make an enemy of your doctor. What sure. you're really trying to do is work with somebody who yeah. wants to work with you. Yeah. And by the way, it should be blood testing and not salivary. And, right. you know, salivary is just we don't have saliva in our muscles. We don't have saliva in our joints. We don't have saliva in our brain. So salivary levels are just not correct. Mm -hmm. You want to know what is coursing through to your body, all of it. Right. Because that's our metabolism depends upon right. it. Our, our function of our organs depend upon it. So blood levels are the way to go, not salivary levels. Right. 
Absolutely. And we'll include that link too, because that is awesome. I, I mean, that is fantastic. That is exactly fantastic. Um, so, so good. So, so good. Awesome. So um, this is this is just great so far. So I really hope people are um, benefiting and feeling really empowered and excited to potentially start looking into some things for themselves. Um, because of, you know, again, this whole concept of, you know, the hormones are, are definitely not the cause of, you know, Brittany's amazing, you know, results and basically turn of, you know, life really, honestly, like, it's like, you feel like a human again, you know, um, or closer to a human than you have in so long, you know, um, and so, you know, Dr. Mon, like, if you want to talk a little bit about, you already did on some level, but if you want to expound on some of those things, um, so people can maybe understand a little bit more, um, in regards to hormonal health and how it can, how it literally affects everything. And I, I think that's what blows my mind so much is that how are we not accessing this? How are we not studying this? How are we not aware of this as, as physicians, you know, as the physicians that are out there and providing this information to, to their, their patients, because so much of how people feel so much of a side effect that they're experiencing. I mean, nine times out of 10, I'm like, that's hormonally related. Like, you can look at this thing over here, but I'm telling you, until you get this figured out, you're still going to feel like that. You know what I mean? Like, it's just- I know exactly what you mean. Blows right. my mind. So if you want to expand on any of that. Well, it, the unfortunate thing is that the way medicine and labs are set up is black and white. Are you in the normal range? Are you out of the normal range? What completely gets lost is are you age appropriate for your hormone and are you in optimal range? Because I don't know any of my former patients who would come in and say, wow, doc, I really hope I'm just in normal range. And I'd look at them and go, no, I want you in optimal range. So yeah. if you have a choice, do you want to be in normal or if you want to be in optimal? Well, yeah, nobody that's wanted such a to be just normal. Such right. a good, a good separation of that. That's so right. important. That's so right. important. So I'm going to also say, would you expect that a 15 year old would have the same hormone levels as somebody who's 25, as somebody who's 35, as somebody who's 45? Well, that's the way medicine looks at it. They give you a range and they say, okay, depending upon where you are in your cycle, you should have a range of this for estradiol. Well, if you're a 45-year young woman and you happen to have something that falls in the range, but you're right down here at the very, very beginning of the range, they just look and say, well, you're in normal range, so you must be fine. Well, what needs to happen is, again, the science needs to be applied. So I'm going to go science-y on you for a minute. And Brittany, you've already seen this, I know, so you, you can laugh. <laughs> But this is, again, my original research. So, again, that's in, you know, that the graph that she is talking about is um, is in her book. And so, first of all, you have to know where your female versus male is. Mm -hmm. And, Brittany, that's what we found out is where your female versus male was. And if we find that you're more male than female, that's a completely different graph, which I won't even show because it'll be way too busy. Um, and that book I'm working on right now, but um, but polycystic ovary, suffice it to say, you're up and down with female your entire menstrual career. But then again, we still have to talk about age appropriate. So again, I go back to is a 15 year old level the same as a 25, the same as a 35, the same as a 45. Right. And this graph would tell you, no, it's not. Right. No, it's not. So are you age appropriate? Mm -hmm. Then you have to ask, are you balanced with your female hormones, your mm -hmm. estradiol, progesterone? Or if you are not, you may be estrogen 
dominant, well, what happens if you're estrogen dominant? It's like too much chocolate all the time. Mm-hmm. It, it's not good for you. So you hyperstimulate your breast and that can lead to a bad mammogram and breast cancer. Nobody ever tells you that. Mm-hmm. It can lead to endometriosis, which can lead to very painful, crampy periods, can lead to infertility. It can also increase fibroids, which are, think of them as muscular knots in your uterus that grow with hormones. So when you're estrogen dominant, your uterus can become irregular and knobby, and it can look like you're pregnant, and you're not, but it's hormone imbalance. It can also lead to conditions like ovarian cysts that continue to recur and rupture, which are very painful. It can lead to scar tissue. So too much of a good thing is just not right either. It The, the balance needs to be there and the age appropriate needs to be there and being more of a girl than a boy needs to be there. That's just the way it is. So all of that sounds like, oh my gosh, how do I keep that straight? Well, that's why I did it for you. That's Mm -hmm. exactly why I'm doing that for you. Sure. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, excellent resources um, are are in your books for sure. So um, yeah, I do encourage anybody to uh, to nab a copy again, even just for for your own you know education and understanding. But I think any anything that you can provide yourself with and arm yourself with going into a physician's office is extremely necessary. I hate to say it, but but you know nowadays, especially with the limited time that that individuals do have. Um, because again, like in, in Brittany's case, it's like, you know, we, we are not wasting any more time with you feeling a particular way. And that's why, you know, when we, when I, you know, when I was saying to you, like, I think this is kind of what's going on. Like, let's just get this figured out. Like, why are we waiting? Right. You know? So again, um, it's just so important, you know, women just do not need, and men, of course, because men go through some very, you know, different, but similar types of things. I mean, you know, but I mean, no one needs to really suffer through that. And I think too, like I'm thinking of, you know, menopause and whatever, it's just something that people don't talk about. Um, But again, the approach around this whole thing has just been, you know, it's a shame is what I'm trying to say too. Anyway. <laughs> well, research led us down the wrong pathway. Yes, that too. The Women's Health Initiative was supposed to be the study mm-hmm. that was going to answer the question of is female hormone good for us? And they were addressing the menopausal woman. And the unfortunate thing is that research in this country, well, research anywhere, is very expensive. And research is usually done at the university level and universities don't fund the research. They go to pharmaceutical companies to help them fund the research. It's kind of like the wolf watching the hen house. Okay. So for that monetary funding for the research, the pharmaceutical company says, then you will use our product. Of course. Okay. So when the women's health initiative was launched, it was meant to be a 10 year study they looked at three parameters, looked at breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. And they expected to see with hormone a drop in all three. Very noble, very wonderful, you know, as far as goal, it, what they were hoping to find. So they embarked and they had several different arms of, and at seven years into the 10-year study, they went behind closed doors to peek at the data. And the press is outside the door, you know, waiting for them to say something. And behind closed doors, they're realizing, well, this isn't at all what we thought we'd find. We're seeing an increase in breast cancer, an increase in heart attack, an increase in stroke. Wait a minute. We've put all this time and money. 20 different major universities are involved. This is a travesty. What are we going to do? What are we going to say? And the press is at the door listening, going, they're not happy. They're not happy. Oh my God. So the press got out their bullhorn and I don't blame the press, but they said, women get off your hormone. Right. And what did the docs say in response? Nothing. Right. Which made the press 
response. Of course. The yeah. believable response. Yeah, naturally, naturally. So the Europeans, meanwhile, had said, well, wait a minute, we also want in on this study. We can not put together as many people as you had. We don't have as much time to put ours together. So we're only going to look at breast cancer. And, oh, by the way, we're not going to use what you guys use for hormone. We're going to use human-based bioidentical hormone, which, okay, that's what everybody would think would have been used, right? Correct, correct. Right. correct. So, well, <laughs> to make a very long story short, the Europeans only looking at breast cancer found no change, mm -hmm. no increase. Right. And when they went back to the Americans to say that, the Americans said, well, you have nothing to say to us. You didn't do the cardiovascular. You didn't do the heart attack or the stroke. Yeah. yeah. So they set up a 10-year stroke and heart attack study in Britain. And guess what they found? A decrease in heart attack, yes. a decrease in stroke, and an increase in longevity. <clears throat> so what did the Americans study? What was so different? Right. Well, they went to Wyeth and Wyeth, any pharmaceutical company has to have something patentable. Okay. So human-based is not patentable, it comes from a human. Anybody can get it, right? So what they used instead was something called Premarin, which mm -hmm. Premarin is pregnant mare's urine. Pregnant right. horse pee? Right. Yes. And the second they the formula they used was Prem Pro, which was Premarin plus a synthetic medroxy progesterone acetate, which by the way is the contraception shot, which should be banned in mm -hmm. this country because it is the cause. And even Dr. Wolf Udian, the, the, the president of the North American Menopause Society at that time, implicated the Provera as the reason for the increase in breast cancer, increase in heart attack, increase in stroke. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, but has that ever been stated to the American public? No. no. So the Americans, to their credit, did do a follow-on study called the KEEPS trial. And that trial took out the Provera, the shot one, and used still Premarin, but then used estradiol and progesterone, the human-based. And guess what they found? The same results that the Europeans found. Of course. But, right. No one's going to say anything. We can't tell the American public. We would embarrass these major universities. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. The American Cancer Society would jump down our throats because they're getting donations like crazy for fright breast cancer and whatever and whatever. And we're on this bandwagon against hormone. Well, we can't just reverse that train. It's mm -hmm. a train running downhill at high speed. We can't just stop that. We'll just, women are resilient. We'll just kind of keep going the way we're going. We just, we just, we won't even talk about it and we won't teach it in medical school. So it's a non-entity. Right. Well, wait a minute. Women are 50% of the population. Right. <laughs> are we really going to let that stay? Right. Hence yeah. my original research and why I was always independent when I was in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And completely understandable. And your research is so, so, so worthwhile. I mean, there's nothing else to say. It's just, it's, it's upsetting, what have you, but this is also why we're doing this podcast. I love shedding light and bringing awareness to things that need light and need a lot of awareness and give people a lot of tools and a lot of verbiage to use as well. So um, I thank you um, so much for um, coming back to the podcast, for speaking as you have, um, for enlightening <laughs> um, some of us as well. Um, and Brittany, I so appreciate you being here too. And again, being brave enough to share your story and all of the things. Um, Brittany, do you have any, any follow-up things that you wanted to say or anything you would want someone to know or I think the overall thing is to keep trying um and always have backup plans I'm somebody who I'll, I'll call it um realistic it's probably pessimistic everyone else is pessimistic but 
Um, you know, and I was trying to find the different clinics and places, you know, I would have appointments set up with somebody, but that's why I was like, I need to get my primary. Then I need a referral to endo. I need to have the plans. Cause I have to assume I'm going to run into walls at each, each go. So I would say to, um, keep trying, you know, Nicole's a great resource, um, to find different places that are willing to do it. There are people, and I think with Dr. Monlock's research, hopefully going forward, there are going to be more people willing to address hormones. So, you know, I have a plan with kind of a care team right now. I've, I've cobbled together. It's a team, it's a team effort. And that's also, you know, unfortunately it's probably going to take a team effort. Nicole had to remind me of that a lot (laughs) um, the last few months that it's going to be, you know, different depending on where people are at. Um, and you know, where they're at with knowing the, about the hormones and studying things and learning. So I would say just to keep trying and it's going to take, yeah, a multidisciplinary team, but it is possible to, you know, try and get that and then keep having, you know, every three months I I'm doing, you know, the blood draw and getting, you know, tweaking if need be, but it is possible to, um, find the answers and find it out. So I would also encourage anybody to, again, use Dr. Monlock's, um, uh, resources and at least go get answers. If you, ha- if you're unable to get those labs pulled, um, at your primary care or anybody's um, place to at least um, get some answers. And from there, then you can take it. And I think two people might be hopefully more willing to listen. If you've got some of the evidence right in front of them. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, yeah. they to find somebody who at least will, will listen and will, um, work with you. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Empowerment is the key. You know, if you have the knowledge, and the knowledge is backed by the science, then it's irrefutable. Then there you are. Thank you both so much. And as I mentioned before, again, all of these little resources will be available in the show notes. Um, and please feel free to uh, reach out uh, if anybody has you know further questions or want to follow up around this pod or have Anything that they want to share, I really love hearing. Uh, I love when people reach out. Um, so please feel free to do that. And uh, thank you too again for your time today. This has been great. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Have questions you want to hear discussed on the show? Find us on Facebook or visit between two pastries.com and drop us a line. Want to support the show? Find us on Patreon for exclusive content. If you love the show, find us on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. Hit the subscribe button and leave us a review.